Good afternoon. Uh, yes, I'm going to talk about the emerging layer housing systems in the United States. And my contact info is shown here. The uh, email address is hxin at iState.edu. If you happen to have additional questions, wish to contact me. U.S. egg industry. Uh, uh, currently, U.S. has a population of uh, about 350 million, and we have a national inventory about uh, uh, just a little under 300 million laying hens. So, so on average, pretty much uh, one bird per person, and those birds produce about 83 billion eggs a year. And our capital consumption of eggs is uh, right now at uh, 258 actually projected to be uh, 261 eggs uh, this year. And those consumed eggs uh, in the form of 70% uh, of it uh, in the form of shell eggs and 30% in the processed eggs, uh, pasta, uh, cake, and so forth. And these eggs, 95%, uh, the bulk of the eggs, obviously produced in the conventional cage housing systems, either high-rise or uh, manure belt system. So, unlike other animal industry, uh, the egg industry also facing uh, issues, challenges uh, such as animal welfare, consumer education, efficiency, profitability, equality, and safety. Environmental issues impact, and then of course uh, the hand uh, workers' uh, health. So all of these will converge into really the bottom line is sustainability of the operation and the industry. For example, a recent, uh, couple of recent developments in Euro European countries and in the U.S. So, as of January 1st, uh, 2012, uh, EU banned the cage operation. Uh, and uh, as a result uh, of that, 25% actually uh, of the total operation was unable to meet that deadline. And uh, so it caused quite a bit of a shortage of egg supply and price hike. And uh, more recently, in 2008, in the state of California, they passed what they called the Proposition 2, which went into effect January 1st of this year. So you know, it basically stipulated that the eggs sold in California must comply with the new space and SE vaccination and testing requirement. So specifically, in terms of production space, so uh, depending on how many birds you have in a a cage. Uh, the space allocation varies from 322 inches for one bird to 116 square inches per bird for uh, the cage size of nine birds or more. And if we compare to the current industry standard uh, United Egg Producer Certified Program, uh, that's looking at uh, 63, 67 square inches per bird. So uh, quite a bit of jump. If you do the math, basically you want to achieve 116 square inches from the current to 67, you basically have to take out 42% uh, of the laying hands to meet that space requirement. So uh, obviously, uh, uh, modern hand housing, uh, there are quite a bit of changes over the past few decades. And you could start from a very primitive uh, backyard, a small flock operation, birds kept on the floor, and to you know, moving the birds into cages, but it's still uh, open-sided uh, and not very well, uh, well controlled environment. And then to then somewhat uh, combined uh, environment controlled uh, environment, and to the totally environment controlled uh, cooling pads and tunnel ventilation systems. So uh, that's kind of where we are. And uh, basically, there are two predominant housing systems in today's production. Uh, the first one being the high-rise cage uh, operation. Uh, let me get the arrow started here. And so the reason it's called high-rise is because the birds then on the top of the building and the manure is in the lower tier, lower level. So you have the fresh air coming in into the attic and through the ceiling inlet, uh, inlet and go through the birds area and then go through the floor slot opening over the manure area then they get exhausted. So this is why it's called a high-rise barn. In this case, then, the manure basically stay in the barn for about a year. So uh, then you take the manure out after fall harvest, uh, Thanksgiving time also. 
So and that's one uh, type of housing system. Typically, uh, these houses uh, contain anywhere between 100,000 birds to up to 250 or even 300,000 birds. And in each cage, uh, once again, so varies between six to eight birds typically. Okay. So uh, the other predominant uh, type of housing is uh, the so-called manure belt cage system. So it can see uh, each of these tiers below uh, each of the ten cage row. Uh, then there's a manure belt, and the manure belt then will take the manure out every three to four days. Okay and either put in a separate storage on farm or in a composting facility. Um, so obviously the air quality is uh, quite a bit uh, uh, better improved in this system. Uh, compared to the, the high-rise housing system, this costs more, about 50% uh, higher in cost. But in the long run, uh, indoor air quality is better and uh, helps improve the uh, bird environment and also the workers' environment. So to help the manure drying on the belt, uh, one of the ways is to, through the forced air uh, drying, so these are blowers, actually, so then you have an air duct, and uh, going through uh, different uh, rows, so each of the rows, actually, you can see there's an air plenum right below the cage above the manure belt. Okay, so here you see the manure belt, and then there's an air duct that's got a holes, then uh, blow, usually about a half to 0.7 CFM per bird, of air then blowing over the manure and help drying the manure. Okay, So here's the blowers you see. So the first it helps drying the manure. The, the faster you dry the manure, the less ammonia volatilization from the manure. But the downside is that you have to pay electricity. A uh, house of 200,000 birds, on average, you pay about uh, 120, 130 dollars of electricity bill per day. So uh, obviously that's kind of an energy concern that does add up. And you can see uh, this particular slide shows kind of the partitioning of uh, electricity use between the blue uh, color is the manure belt uh, blowers that uh, in a range of anywhere between 55 to 72 percent of the total electricity is due to the uh, operation of the blowers. And uh, the red then is the ventilation, obviously, is the seasonal. In the summertime, you use more fans and you have more electricity use. The grain basically remaining the feeders, the egg belts, and so forth, and that consists, uh, make up the total electricity uh, use for the, uh, the house, okay? So to reduce the energy use, so one of the ways is to utilize the existing resources, uh, i.e. the exhaust air already warmed from the barn, and uh, so you actually move the manure to a kind of a chamber tunnel. This is called a kind of a drying tunnel, as you can see here. So basically, exhaust air then blow over the manure and uh, as exhausted out. So it's in the process to dry the manure that way. Okay? So that's uh, one of the ways to reduce the uh, energy cost. So you're looking at these two predominant housing systems, the high-rise versus the belt system. You can see this ammonia emission rate, ER, and in terms of gram per animal unit per day. Animal unit is 500 kilograms of body weight or about 1,100 pounds. So for layers, so we're really looking at uh, leg on layers, so we're looking at about uh, 330 birds or so. so and now you're looking at these uh, uh, emission rates, so this is kind of a uh, look at summary of all the literature available, whether in U.S. and Europe. You can see the emission rate uh, for the high rise and the versus the belt at the house level. So it's a little over 10 percent of what the high rise emit for the belt house. But then say, well, of course you have the manure storage on farm as well, so that has to be factored in as a look at the farm as a system. So even you include the manure storage, we're still looking at about one third of the manure, the, uh, the ammonia em emission from the belt houses relative to the high-rise bars. And so, um, so from the environmental standpoint, uh, the belt houses is more friendly. So it is not surprising. So as of uh, 2011, essentially, looking at a new construction uh, in U.S., uh, the high-rise the bars essentially kind of decline, and and all the new uh, construction then is all manure belt housing. Systems. So now it's 100% manure belt. Okay. So because of the animal welfare concerns, there are a lot of interest on alternative housing systems. 
and one of them being the, uh, the so-called enriched uh, uh, colony system. And uh, so uh, it's enriched because uh, the features of the phone. First of all, these houses, the larger colony size, so contain these out of six to eight birds. You got a 60 birds in the colony. So the area of the birds, the space allocation is more, so 116 is typical. So also then there's some amenities uh, purchase. You can see these, and also you can see these down here. Uh, nest boxes in here, so the birds wanted to have a privacy uh, place to lay eggs. And also kind of uh, allow them to exercise natural behavior. Then you have the scratch pad area, so they can do some uh, dust spacing behavior. Okay, so this is kind of a shot of a, a enriched colony system. You can see the birds are kind of on the on top of the perch. All right, so uh, that's that's one of the uh, prevailing system we're looking at here. So the other thing is uh, the cage-free. So uh, the enriched colony still, some countries still consider as so that's a steel cage system, uh, and uh, those eggs are actually la are still labeled as cage eggs in certain European countries. And uh, so the other one is the cage-free aviary housing system. In this particular system, then the birds can then uh, uh, have the free access to litter. You can see there's also colony in here, but uh, uh, Especially during the daytime, bird will come off the colony and going to the floor, do the dust basing, exercising, moving around. So it's cage free. And some of the system has got a, a door automatically closed or open, trying to do the nest training. So make sure the eggs are laid in the nest uh, instead of uh, having a lot of floor eggs, which generates uh, then the food safety concerns. Okay. So this is a, the idea here is that multiple tiers as to better utilize the vertical space. Okay. So that's kind of, this is a cross-sectional view. You can see uh, these uh, colony rows, and then you have the floor open areas, and then you have the inspection aisles, okay, for the workers. Okay. There's another view of the uh, Avery hand housing system. Once again, you can see the inspection aisle in here, uh, middle here, then the ventilation of the box inlets coming for fresh air coming in, the egg belts in here, first on the floor. So another shot of the uh, uh, different uh, uh, breeds of birds on the floor. Okay. And of course, uh, there are other type of housing, which is even though it's all probably between five, six percent of uh, uh, cage free uh, and a single level cage free and nest box in the middle here. And this is, of course, the avery housing system and also the free range where the birds have access to outdoor uh, one weather permit. Okay. So in the U.S., uh, uh, even though with all these emerging systems, there are uh, limited information, really, data uh, in terms of documenting what are the pros and cons of each of the systems, so what are the limitations. So um, then uh, a national study uh, a group uh, was formed including uh, Land Grant University, Michigan State University, University of California, Iowa State, and also working with the USDA RF, uh, plus the uh, industry, uh, Cargill McDonald's, really form a correlation for sustainable egg supply where uh, we compare the three housing systems to so collect the real field data. Uh, have the commercial cage system and the enriched colony system and an avery housing system. So. Uh, we have gone through two flocks of data, so this, uh, uh, the conventional cages exist, is existing 200,000 birds uh, house, and each of these two houses are 50,000 birds, uh, brand new, so built on the same site, and they want to do side-by-side -side comparison in terms of uh, the holistic approach, looking at the environment, animal welfare, uh, food affordability, basic economics of production, worker health, and, and egg quality and safety. So, really looking from a holistic standpoint, not just the one partial, just animal welfare, okay? So quickly share some results of this, just from the environmental standpoint, uh, on the uh, ammonia concentration, indoor air quality, you can see the red represents the avery housing, the blue and the, the and, uh, green are, are uh, conventional and enriched quality. You can see uh, these are daily ammonia concentration, so Pretty much for the uh, CC and EC housing systems, they pretty much maintain below 15 ppm. Whereas for the avery housing, their days in the winter time were 
it's uh, ammonia content exceeded uh, 25 ppm, which is sort of a, a uh, recommended uh, uh, guideline uh, by the industry uh, trying to keep ammonia level below 25 ppm for the purpose of bird health. So the other thing is looking at indoor air quality from the PM uh, particular matter concentration. You can see once again the aviary housing is uh, considerably higher on the uh, the dust level. Uh, so this is just two flocks of data, and uh, it's not surprising when the birds do the dust bathing on the litter, so it stirred up a quite a bit of the dust. And ammonia is the same thing. So part of the litter is uh, deposited on the uh, litter on the floor, so it's not taken out until the end of the flock. So when you have a litter, then you would you will have some ammonia emission from the uh, litter itself. Then, so summarize on the uh, the uh, so that was the concentration. What are the emissions? So emission basically is the product of the concentration time and the ventilation rate. So we look at it from the house level and the manure storage level. Okay. And then the farm level, which is a summation of this. You can see the CC and AV, uh, AV system essentially identical at a 0.3 gram of, of, of uh, ammonia per gram per day. And the EC system is about a half. So the EC system, part of the reason is because of low stocking density and when you get dried better. And the CCF is 80 square inches, the EC is uh, 116. So when you have less manure on the belt, it's got dried faster, uh, the manure is drier, therefore less uh, ammonia volatilization. So if you look at the storage, though, how much did I account for the total emission? So we're looking at about 60 to 72 percent. So basically we're saying if we wanted to focus on further mitigation of ammonia, so where should we uh, invest? Well, then, so the data show us as well, we should be looking at the storage instead of house houses. Uh, quite a small amount of, uh, of the uh, uh, total emission. Then we look at the uh, PM emission. Uh, we're looking at different units, so whether it's a milligram per hem per day, or animal unit, or, or kilogram of uh, eggs produced. So whichever way you're looking at, the CC and EC is essentially identical. So like a 16 milligrams of uh, PM10 per hem per day versus 100 for the AV. So same sort of a relationship for the uh, PM 2.5. So the AV uh, uh, emitted considerable about uh, uh, six, eight times more of uh, uh, PM uh, emissions. So in closure, so uh, concerns over animal welfare have led to the development and some adoption of alternative housing uh, systems. And each of these, of course, has got a pros and cons. Uh, so when you have uh, more space for the birds, uh, then uh, start having some environmental issues. So, so we have to look at, uh, when we look at these uh, housing systems, we have to take uh, the holistic approach, and not just the animal welfare, but uh, food safety, environmental impact, and uh, food affordability. So the CSES um, project, the full report will come out uh, uh, later in March. So stay tuned. Uh, so it will be issued by the uh, Center for Food Integrity. And uh, so we'll include all these different aspects. What I just presented is only just the uh, environmental component, just so there will be food safety, animal welfare, worker health, and economics. So finally, I want to just uh, remind the audience uh, who are interested in uh, learning more about the industry, the issues, and the ongoing research, so on and so forth. Uh, so we, the Egg Industry Center does hold the annual forums. And uh, so this year is going to be our number seven forum, uh, going to be April 7th and 8th, going to be in Des Moines, Iowa. And you can uh, look the check out the details uh, at the, uh, the www.agendacenter.org. The early bird registration, I believe, is the next week, March the 15th. So with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you for your attention.